Can you give the Lord and Brother Mike Wilson a hand clap in Jesus' name? Feel your liberty, Brother oh, Mike. thank the bless Lord. You. God bless you. You may be seated. Where would we be tonight if God was not on our side? How about it? seated. Uh, some years ago, Sister Wilson and I were honored to, uh, to go into the Women's Reformatory Prison in the state of Ohio, along with 31 other ministry individuals, husbands and wives, pastors and their wives, etc., to do a Friday night uh, and all-day Saturday convention or conference. And uh, that whole weekend, another church group went in on Sunday, and through the whole weekend, we baptized 87, or 87 ladies received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in that one weekend, in that, in that uh, conference. I was one of the speakers for Saturday, and they asked me to sing a few songs, and so I sat down at the keyboard and I looked at 225 uh, incarcerated ladies and uh, I told them, I said, uh, I've only been arrested one time. And all over that room, ladies began to, me too, me too, me too, me too. And uh, I said, yes, but uh, I've got, I don't know if the, yours was the same as mine. I said, I was arrested when I was seven years old. And they gasped. You could hear the air go out of the room. <gasps> you know, I said, yeah. I said, I was seven years old. I was arrested. I said, would you believe I was arrested on Sunday? 
And I said, would you furthermore believe that I was arrested in church on Sunday? And, man, I could have told those ladies anything because I had them eating right out of my hand right there, you know. <laughs> they was all sitting up on the edge of their seat listening. I said, yeah, I said, that's true. And I said, a preacher preached a message on a Sunday night in a church service. And when he preached that message, I was arrested by mercy. And I sang this song. Let me start this at the beginning. It'll help me out. Here we go. grace called red handed by the blood my rap sheet was suspect my name was no good I was guilty and I knew it but I ran from his love but the long arms of Jesus to me from above I was arrested by mercy when I was fleeing the scene I was in a great big hurry I had done many wrong With only me on his mind I was arrested by mercy And that just in time Are you hiding from the Savior So afraid to be found As the sins of your old lifestyle got your world upside down. What you should do is surrender. Come out with your hands up and let mercy arrest you, wrapping you in God's love. I was arrested by mercy when I was fleeing the sea. I was in a great big hurry. I had done many wrong things. God sent an angel. Is mine. I was arrested by mercy and that just in time. God sent an angel with only me on his mind. I was arrested by mercy. And that just in time. Praise God. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Well, glory. Are, are you glad that the arresting officer was named Jesus? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Arrested us. By his mercy. I'm glad today that I've been arrested by the mercy of God. It's great to be in, in Winsboro, Louisiana. About half the time I have to ask, where are we tonight? I, we go so many different places. And, and we don't stay long enough usually for me to get my bearings and, and realize where I've been. So 
But I'm glad we're here for a few days, and we're uh, parked at the Wollaston M M uh, Marriott out in the country. Uh, it comes with it has come with uh, lunch and breakfast, some or dinner or whatever it is. We've eaten several times out there already, and didn't even ask them for it. Didn't have to come in and ask for breakfast or whatever. So these are wonderful friends. Uh, Brother Wayne, Sister Rita Smith, were, he was a dear friend. Sister Rita's here tonight. And remember her for, oh my, we don't want to start counting the years back, I don't think, because uh, she's not aging like the rest of us are, like, like I am at least. And uh, forever young, that's what the song said. And uh, Brother David, Sister Amy, and these boys and this good-looking chick over there sitting beside her mama. I asked her tonight at supper, I said, how old are you? And she told me. I said, well, I, was, I said, I'm trying to figure out if I got a grandson about your age. And I heard her whisper to her, Daddy, is he, is he trying to fix me up? I said, absolutely, I am somebody that pretty. <laughs> oh, wow. And you know what? I got a grandson just about the right age. Yes, sir. So if we can get him out of Memphis, who knows? Y'all might get you a, a transplant one of these days. <laughs> He's a good one. He's a good one. I talked to him the other day, and I was asking him about uh, going to church and praying and uh, speaking in tongues and I said, Liam, I said, uh, when you go to church, uh, I said, have, have you spoken in tongues lately? He said, Papa, I talk in tongues every time I go to church. I said, well, there you go then. So so here we are. He's at least got the Holy Ghost. Amen. But that, he's, he's good looking too, I promise you that. Amen. It's good to see Sister Julie and that fine husband of hers tonight, and all of you that, that uh, I don't know your names, and, uh, but I, I want to know your names. We want to get acquainted with you a little bit better in this service. I, I appreciate you turning the service over to me early. I'm glad y'all started at 7. If y'all had started at 6.30, I'd have had 30 more minutes. <laughs> I know what you're fixing to do. You're getting nervous right now, aren't you? How many of you believe that America needs a revival? Amen. America needs a revival. It really needs, I think it needs an old-fashioned style revival, one that, where sinners got nervous and ran to altars and, and uh, cried out to God. You don't see many tears in altars anymore. But we need to. America needs a revival. I've written songs since 1983 or 84, and on one hand, I could probably count you the up-tempo songs that I've written. That means the faster ones because I'm just built more for comfort than I was speed. And, and so uh, I don't write many fast songs. I like to write those tear jerkers as much as I can. But I have to, have to write one every once in a while to put on a CD project. So the new CD project has got one fast song on it. It's really not fast, but it's faster than I normally write. But it says we need an old-fashioned revival. I'd like to have old-fashioned style revival, but I like it in carpets and carpeted floors and air conditioning and patty pews. I think we could do that if we, if we would just pray and seek the Lord. God, give us a great revival once again. Don't you? As the spirit moved with singing, shout and testify. When the preacher preached, you'd feel God's glory from above. Cause everybody there was filled with love. God give us great revival, like we had in days gone by. When the joy of heaven made us feel like we were gonna fly. Send your spirit moving through the souls of hope. Break the Bible once again. Once again. Oh, in those sawdust altars, 
sinners cried out to the Lord as saints would pray and intercede all in one accord. Don't let us lose the power that we had back in those days. God grant one more revival in this place. God give us great revival like we had in days gone by when the joy of heaven made us feel like we were gone. Send your spirit moving through the souls of hungry men. God, give us great revival once again. We need an old fashioned heaven sent Holy Ghost revival. Touching me, touching me, touching you. Oh, send your spirit moving through the souls of hungry men. God, give us great revival once again. Yes, Lord, give us great revival once again. Once again. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 31 years ago, about this time of the year, my, my nephew and niece came from the state of Georgia, Brother Tim Hammond, Sister Dorcas, came from Georgia to North Mississippi to be uh, there at the Bethlehem Church, my home church, and uh, they were playing uh, a softball tournament there at the church that weekend, and my dad who was still pastor, asked, asked Brother Tim Hammond to stay over and preach. And so he preached on Sunday morning, and while he was preaching, during his preaching, I guess, I wrote at least part of a song, finished it, uh, I'm sure at a later date, but uh, began a song because he preached that morning uh, a message titled, a God of a second chance. And I wrote a chorus, I'm sure, probably to play at the end of his message. But I went ahead and finished the song and sent it to Nashville, Tennessee, to the music publishers that I was using at that time. And they listened to it and told me that uh, they did not have anybody that would record it right at the end. And so uh, they just basically give it back to me, send it back to me. So I just dropped the lyric sheet in the, in the bottom of file cabinet. And, and 31 years later, actually 30 years later, last summer, I was looking for material to finish out this CD project that I've got out there today. And, and I saw this lyric. Uh, sheet laying in the bottom of this file cabinet. Pulled it out, put it on my keyboard, and one afternoon I was sitting there playing chords and uh, meditating and saw this lyric sheet there, and I had forgotten the original tune of the song. I had forgotten the original tempo of the song. All I had was the lyric sheet. So as I sat there and played that afternoon, I began to sing uh, these 31 year old lyrics and uh, to a brand new tune and tempo uh, a song called He's a God of a Second Chance I recorded this on the CD project that's out there the Hoppers uh, picked this up the other day and they've recorded this, this song should be out a little later on in this year God of a second chance. I wanted you to listen to it. Peter thrice denied the Lord outside the judgment hall. Felt so God forsaken. Felt there was no hope at all. Christ the Lord remembered him 
restored his faith again. God is a God of a second chance. God is a God of a second chance. God is a God of sweet deliverance. Though you may have failed Him, He knows just where you've been. God is a God second chance Do you feel defeated by wrongful consequence Do you feel overtaken by sinful circumstance You can be forgiven the same God is a God of a second chance. Satan come a knocking, tempting you to fall. Is he always pushing? Got your back up to the wall. You don't have to give way. Stand up and try again. God is a God of a second chance. God is a God of a second chance. Pastor asked me to tell you about the song Address Change. Uh, you may have heard this. If you listen to Southern Gospel Radio, uh, Enlighten uh, is the XM channel. Is it 65? I believe it's, I think it used to be 65. But uh, if you listen to XM uh, Radio, Channel 65, which is Enlighten Radio, you may hear, you may get to hear Address Change again. An old song that I wrote in 1984. Uh, Clint Brown, the first cousin of Brother Tony, of uh, Brother Tim Spell, he and a uh, other couple of young men have uh, recorded that song, and it is being played on Southern Gospel radio stations. If you have, if you have uh, Pandora, iTunes, all of those, whatever they call music apps, uh, they're being played. It's being played there too. You can listen to it, and uh, it is after 37 years, I think it's been since I wrote that song, it is finally being played nationally on, on radio, and I thank the Lord for that. <laughs> great old, great old, almost a standard of the church now, hallelujah. Just think about that, an old country boy wrote that song. 
Well, I got my good-looking chick with me tonight. I got my girlfriend. I brought her along. She always makes me look good. Uh, I tell everybody when, when I take her with me, my stock goes up. Everybody thinks I'm really somebody, you know, for sure when, I, when they see who I'm running around with. I've been running around with her for 48 and a half years. And if she'll, if she'll have mercy on me, I'm going to stay with her another couple anyway. Glad to have my wife with me, Sister Joyce Wilson, my, my beautiful wife. I love her. And everybody that meets Sister Joyce Wilson seems to instantly fall in love with her. And, uh, and once you get to know her, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Precious child of God. Thank the Lord. It's such an honor to be here on a Wednesday night. Uh, it's just, it's just happy. To, I'm just happy to be here. I love God's people. I'm as comfortable as an old uh, house shoe right now. I'm not nervous. I'm not. Uh, I just feel like I'm just good. You know, I get nervous trying to preach in, in, in great big places sometimes. When I see good folks like you, it just makes it. Makes it uh, so much easier on me, and uh, I want I want to talk to you for a few moments tonight about something that the Lord uh, laid on my heart today for you. Uh, a message that I have not preached an awful lot, a few times, but I, I felt directed today to take you to the Book of Psalms, chapter eighty-four. Thank you for standing in honor of the word of the Lord. I'll try to preach about as long as I sung. How's that sound? Oh, now I wish I'd sung about five more songs. <laughs> uh, Psalms chapter 84, beginning with verse 1. If you brought a Bible, open it there. If you didn't, bring a Bible. I think our brother has our scriptures on the screen for us tonight. God bless you. Verse 1 of 84 in Psalm says, How amiable, amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Verse 3 is where I want to draw your attention tonight. Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. I want you to notice where the sparrow and the swallow found their house. Swallow and the sparrow have found a house, the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, and then the next three words gives us where they found their house. Even thine altars. So for a little while tonight, let me preach to you a message with this title, A Place for Sparrows. A Place for Sparrows. Before you're seated, Let's look at Matthew chapter 10, Matthew 10, verse 29, and verse 29 through 31. Matthew 10, 29 through 31. Jesus said, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. 
Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. A place for sparrows. God bless you. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Now, in Scripture, the word sparrow is the name that is given to actually several different species of birds in the Bible. Small, grain-eating, insect-eating little birds were sort of all lumped together instead of giving you all of the different names. They are all collected together and they are known as sparrows or perhaps swallows. And these little birds would always gather together in noisy flocks. They wanted to be together. They felt the need to be together. They would build their nest, which were sometimes untidy little nests. They would build them in the eaves of houses. But sometimes they would even build their nests in the temple. Now, I want you to understand that when we're talking about the temple here in Psalms 84, we were not talking about Solomon's temple. It had not been built yet. You remember when David got the Ark of the Covenant back from the Philistines? David wanted everybody to have access to the tabernacle. He didn't particularly like the idea that the Ark of the Covenant was stuck behind heavy curtains and only a certain number of priests could see it. He wanted everybody to be having access to that Ark of the Covenant. So David put up a tent. He put up a tent, an open-air tent, as it were, and folks could pretty well come in and get close to the presence of God through that open-air tent. Well, that open-air tent, no doubt, would sit out in the open air, open, uh, open spaces, and, and the little birds would flit around that outside uh, the, the outside of that tent and they would find their way they would find their way into David's tabernacles what the Bible called it and somehow or other these little sparrows these little swallows they would nest they would make them a nest near the altar in the tabernacle. So David said, the sparrows have found a house. The swallows have found a nest for themselves. And he said, I want to tell you where it is. He said, it is at thine altars. Remember the book of Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitude chapter? One of the Beatitudes was, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the days of Jesus Christ, 
Sparrows were sold in the marketplaces to the poor and the underprivileged who could not afford a lamb, who could not afford a bullock to bring for their sin sacrifice. They were sold in these marketplaces, and during that time of sales, Sparrows were sold for a very, very low price. Two sparrows could be bought for a copper coin. And this copper coin was a very small Roman coin. It was worth approximately one-sixteenth of a silver denarius. And being such, it was worth less than a quarter in our U.S. currency today. And those underprivileged people who needed a sacrifice for their sin could buy a sparrow. They were so uh, low in value that in order to make a sale, those merchants would make a deal. They said, we'll sell you two sparrows for one farthing. And then Luke 12 and 6 tells us that five sparrows were sold for Two farthing. So they said, if you'll buy five, we'll sell you five for two. We'll sell you two for one farthing, but we'll sell you five for two farthing. You buy four, and we'll give you. That one sparrow. I'm trying to let you know that in the days of Jesus Christ, the sparrow was not worth very much. They were so insignificant that the seller would throw in one for free. But it was that one free one that Jesus said, not one of them Not one of them is forgotten before God. God's care for his creation is so great that even that extra little sparrow was noted and it was observed by the God of all creation. Mm, hallelujah. Now, you compare a little sparrow to a mighty eagle. And there is no comparison necessarily. The sparrows were looked upon with pity and they were looked upon with a lot of disdain because they were small, defenseless, weak, easy prey because of their frailty. Alongside that powerful eagle who, with one swoop of his wing, could soar one quarter of a mile. That great eagle who, with his eagle vision from one quarter of a mile above, could spot a trout swimming in a stream. And with laser-like precision, that eagle could tuck his wings and go into a dead dive and come up right above water at just the right height to reach his eagle talons into the water and pull that trout out and never break stride, never move, never move away from his original flight pattern. He could just swoop up and turn do a, you know, a, a roll in the sky and back into the heavens he could soar. 
That's the eagle. When the eagle could sense a storm coming, the eagle, all he would do would just flap those powerful wings of his and he would get above. He would, be, he would get above the storm currents. He would, be, he would get above the wind currents and he would sail on top of the storm while the little sparrow was left down below to fight off the winds if he could. And in those storms, that little sparrow could quickly become a homeless, frightened little bird, a little lost bird unable to find safety from those storms. came by tonight to preach to sparrows. I'm here to preach to sparrows. I'm here to preach to those who may be prone to weakness. Those who may be given to struggle. may find yourself often discouraged instead of encouraged. Those who find yourself in more trouble than you do peacetime. You find yourself in more heartache than you do heart cheering. I'm preaching for eagles tonight. If you feel like one of those defenseless, weakened, frail little sparrows, then I've just come to let you know that there's a word of God. There is a word from God out of the word of God for us tonight. David, in this psalm, for a man named Korah, he lets us know how he feels about the house of God when he says how amiable which means how pleasant and how agreeable are thy tabernacles, O oh Lord. You know what? Church don't agree with a lot of folks. Huh? Church don't agree with a lot of folks. A lot of folks get nervous when they walk into church. Huh? Huh? A lot of folks get scared when they walk in church. David said, how amiable, how pleasant, how agreeable are thy tabernacles to me, O God. I, make, I can find myself comfortable in the house of God. Oh, you know what? Some folks need to come to church more. The more you come to church, the more comfortable you get in church. The more you hear hand clapping, the more comfortable you get around it. The more, you, the more you see folks running the aisles, the more easily it is for you to enjoy it. Hallelujah. My God. Some folks go to church and if somebody talks out in tongues, they get nervous and run out the door. Sure sign you hadn't been in church long enough. You need to go more often. What are we doing? We're just speaking our language, that's all. That's right. That's right. That's right. Huh? Right. He said, how agreeable, how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord. All of the places, God, that you choose to dwell. All of thy tabernacles are pleasant places for me. They are agreeable places for me, Lord. So I asked you tonight, does church agree with you? I says, does church agree with you? Does church make you feel good? Do you feel better when you leave than you did when you came? Huh? That's what church is supposed to do for church, folks. Church agrees with us. Your tabernacles, he said, your sanctuaries, they are so pleasant that the tiny sparrows and the swallows have found in them a place 
to dwell. They have found a house in your house. They found a place that is suitable for them to build them a house. David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hey, I'm almost nervous to say this, ask this question because Brother and Sister Woolison are here and we're parked on their yard. But are there some folks that you don't mind coming by for a visit? But you don't really want them to stay all day? Huh? You know, you don't mind them coming in. You'll, you'll offer them a cup of coffee, but you don't offer them a cup of coffee and cake. Because you don't want them there all day long. Huh? Just trying to make a point. Y'all hang on. David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's a difference when, between dwelling and visiting. David said, I'll just live in your house. I'll just stay here. I'll, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek of, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. In the house of the Lord, there's safety to be found. That's why David said, I'll just live here. Them little old swallows, them little old sparrows that flitted around out, outdoors around that tabernacle, they got, so, they got so comfortable being in the presence of God, they said, hmm, I believe this would be a nice place to build a nest right here. I'll build my house. I'm going to dwell right here at the altar. Safety from the storms of life, safety from anything that would try to destroy them. We can find safety in the house of the Lord. We can find fellowship in the house of the Lord. My old dad, if he was still alive, Sister, Sister Smith, he'd say it takes two fellows in the same ship to make fellowship. <laughs> now, I'm sure that David must have had his days, Pastor Smith, when, when he felt like one of those strong eagles. I'm sure there were hours in his lifetime when he felt like he was one of those all-powerful eagles after all. I mean, at one time in his life, he had men coming to him from all over the place. He had men just flocking to him, wanting to be part of his, wanting to be a part of his army. We'll stay with you. We'll take care of you. He had guys that loved him so much that three of the guys said, I, hey, you want a drink of water? You want a drink of water out of the well of Bethlehem? Don't worry about it. We'll get that for you. And they had to break through the host of the Philistines to get it. That's how many people wanted to be around David. So at that time in his life, I'm sure David must have felt like, man, I got the world by the tail. I'm one of those strong eagles, and I'm soaring mighty high right now. Untouchable, unslayable. I mean, David was the kind of guy, I mean, he wasn't just a songwriter like me. David was also a soldier. He was a king. He was a soldier. He was a songwriter. He was a musician. I mean, if he didn't like you, he'd kill you. He'd kill you, then sit down and write a song about you and sing it while he's eating supper. That's, that's, how much, that's how strong he was. That's, that's what kind of man he was. So at times, I'm sure he felt like that eagle soaring mighty high. But then there were times when he got real low and he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm just a lowly little sheep out in the pasture. The Lord is my shepherd. It was in those times that David felt like that little sparrow. So he said, I know where there's a house. I know where I can find me a house, a place of protection, a place of love, a place of caring. I don't have to dwell out here in the forest somewhere. 
I don't have to dwell on the hole, in the hole somewhere in a cave. He said, the sparrow has found a house. David found him a house. He said, I'll tell you what. I'll just build me a house by the altar. <laughs> you want to find me? Come looking for me at the altar. My address is going to have altar in it somewhere. My zip code is going to have altar in it somewhere. Not just any old altar. Not just one of those altars built to an idol god. Not just not one of those altars built to a false deity. No, sir. This was one of those altars that was built to the almighty God. He said, I found me a house. Hallelujah. Even at thine altar, O oh Lord. There's a place for sparrows. There's a place for the weak ones. There's a place for the hurting ones. There's a place for the lonely ones. There's a place for those cast out ones. There's a place where, for, for all of those that feel like nobody loves me anymore. You know where it is? It's in the altar. Because see, if you'll find your way to an altar, you can talk to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and you who feels like there's nobody in the world that cares for you. All of, all of a sudden, you'll feel like it don't matter if nobody else cares for me because he cares for me. I found that out at the altar. Hallelujah. Oh, worship the Lord for a moment. Come on. Hallelujah. Boy, boy, boy. Spirit of the Lord is moving right here, right now. I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. On my phone, on my phone, on my, in my motorhome, in my little automobile, on your phone, you probably got it, GPS. Global Positioning System. Right? And from wherever you are, you can put wherever you want to go. And it'll, it'll show you a way out of, your, out of your trial, out of your lost last turn. It'll show you out of that country road and get you into the biggest cities in America. Huh? GPS will get you there. Why can't we figure out something called God's positioning system? I don't want to tell you. I want to tell you something. God's positioning system always has a starting point. God's positioning system always had a starting point, and it is the altar. The life of a child of God begins at the altar. Every day thereafter, it needs to begin at the altar. Because the altar is a place for protection from the world. I said it is a place of protection from the world. It's hard for the devil to get you when you're praying in tongues in the altar. It's hard for the enemy of your soul to knock you sideways when you're in the altar praying, seeking God. The altar is a place of protection from the world. When we stop praying, the world comes slipping in to our lives. Well, I don't have to pray today. I prayed yesterday. When we stop praying, the world starts slipping in. When we stop playing, praying, the things of the world start slipping in. When we stop praying, the attitudes of this world come slipping in. When we stop praying, the mannerisms of this world 
come in. The cares of this world will come into our lives if and when we get away from the altar. The altar is a place of protection. The altar is a place of redemption from our sinfulness. We can be redeemed at the altar. The altar is where we leave our sacrifices of praise and worship to God. We've got to have an altar. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews said, we have an altar. Back in 1970, 71, I was in Bible college in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, and a preacher by the name of Reverend Alan Oggs came through there, and he preached a chapel service on a Wednesday morning. And when he got finished preaching a message titled, We Have an Altar, there wasn't a dry eye amongst all of us Bible students. The altars were full of young Bible students who were there studying to be preachers and preachers' wives, and etc. They were there to further their knowledge of the Word of God. He preached to us that morning, we have an altar for such a time as this. We may not have money to cover it. We may not have an answer to answer it. We may not have a situation fixer to fix it for us. But if we have an altar, we may not have a rich uncle to fall back on. But if we have an altar, we can connect with the God of the universe who said it is the Father's good pleasure to give his children the kingdom. We have an altar. The sparrows have found a house, even thine altar. Listen to me now. We have an altar even if we don't have an answer. I said, we have an altar when we don't have an answer. And I want to tell you something else. We have an altar even when we don't have a prayer. You ever been in one of those situations? Feel like you don't have a prayer? Oh, I've been there. I've been there. Sick children. Situations beyond my control. Far beyond anything that I could do. I didn't have an answer, but I knew a God that did. And I knew where this sparrow could find a house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We have an altar even when we feel like we don't have a prayer. We have an altar even when we don't have an explanation for all of our days that end in why. Huh? You know, every day of the week ends in why. But many of those days we go to bed sometimes and we don't have an answer for all of our days that end in why. Why, God? Why? 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 We've got an altar for that. <laughs> I've got an altar for that. Because if I don't know the answer, if I can't figure out the why, all I've got to figure out is the who. And if you can figure out the who, I want to help somebody. I want to encourage somebody tonight. You might not have the answer. You may not be able to figure it out on your own. But if you can figure out the who in this situation, if you can understand that not even that extra little sparrow falls, 
Not that one, that one little sparrow does not fall to the ground. The Bible says without him. The little sparrows knew where home was. Amazingly, they realized, they recognized the altar for what it was. Home. I believe too many have forgotten what the altar's for. Too many, it seems, have forgotten where home is. We try to find all of our answers in all kind of situations and all kind of gadgets and gizmos and, and uh, special uh, special books that you can check out of the library or buy off the buy off the shelf somewhere in some uh, uh, books a million store. I can get the answer here. You might not. You might not. But if you can get to the altar. Hezekiah got word that the enemy king was coming in, going to destroy him. They wrote a proclamation against Hezekiah and the country and said, here, here's what we're going to do to you. What did Hezekiah do? King Hezekiah took that, he took that letter he took that letter and he took it to the altar. He took it to the altar. He spread it out before the Lord. And he said, Lord, I want you to open your eyes. I want you to see what they said they're going to do to us. And when God saw the writing, he saw it from the altar. He saw the letter on the altar, and God said, I ain't letting that happen. That's not going to happen. It's going to be completely different, and you read your Old Testament, and you'll realize what I'm telling you is true. God turned the tables on that situation, and there were thousands destroyed. There were thousands destroyed armies by the thousands turned their backs and fled from what they were about to destroy themselves. They fled from it lest they be destroyed. Why? Because one king said, here I want you to see what they're going to do to you. There's an old song. Brother Smith, we used to sing Dottie Rambo wrote it, I believe, many years ago. She said, bring all your needs to the altar. Bring all your needs to the Lord. For he is so willing and able to help you. So bring all your needs to the Lord. We might need to recalibrate our GPS system. I said we might need to recalibrate our GPS system because we might have we might have allowed that GPS GPS system to get get out of line, out of, out of whack. It. We might be looking to the doctor for the help. We might be looking for the banker for the help. We might be looking for the, this guy to do it and the government to do it. And we might be putting all of our faith and con confidence in man when we need a GPS. We need to recalibrate that GPS to the altar and say, I'm going to start right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start right here. I'm going to pray first. I'm going to pray first. We don't need to forget where home is. Home is the altar. David said, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Genesis 26, 25. You look at what Isaac did. 
The Bible said he builded an altar there. He builded an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. There's two things that a home needs. It needs a well, it needs water, and it needs an altar. I said it needs water and it needs an altar. You can't live without water naturally and you can't live without an altar spiritually. Isaac built an altar and then he set up his tent right close to where the altar was. Don't build your house, parents. Don't build your home too far from the altar. Don't get, caught, don't get caught up in getting a job uh, 75, 100 miles away from here because you can make, make $200 more a week if it's going to cause you to pull your family away from this altar because in the long run, you'll regret it. You may lose your soul because of it. Oh, I'm preaching now. You need to build an altar, and then you can set up your house. Because if the little tiny sparrow could understand that the altar is the best place to live, so much the more you and I ought to be able to realize that. I'm convinced today that far too many are setting up their dwelling places too far away from the altar. Don't be like Lot. Don't pitch your tent towards Sodom. Don't pitch your tent toward iniquity. Don't build your house toward abomination. Don't set up housekeeping near rebellion. Oh, hallelujah. The little sparrows found a house. They found a proper and good dwelling place at the altar in the house of God. Could I end this message tonight by saying, little sparrow, whoever you are, there's a place of safety, a place of forgiveness, a place of cleansing, a place of redemption that is awaiting you in the house of God at the altar of God. So, if you look around at all the strong eagles that you've looked up to all your life, if it looks like they're soaring to the heights, if it looks like they are, they're, they're soaring so far away from anything you would ever reach, soaring in their loftiness, quit worrying about them. That's not your place to worry about the eagles. Your house is at the altar. I said your dwelling place is at the altar. Why? Because that's where God's spirit dwells. That's where God's spirit moves. That's where God answers prayer. That's where God's spirit heals and cleanses and washes us. And the altar is where our provisions are met. And as I'm seated tonight, I want you to remember this. If you're a sparrow, if you see yourself as a sparrow, I want you to remember that not one of you falls to the ground without your heavenly Father seeing it and coming to your rescue. A place for sparrows. Why don't we stand right now? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bring all your needs to the altar. Thank God for a place for sparrows.
Would you like to step out of your seat for a moment tonight? Step around the front of this building. Find you a place at this altar and say, God, I'm here. I'm here and I want you to confirm your word that has been preached to my heart tonight. I want you to confirm your word in me with signs following, Lord. Let me, oh God, find my place in the altar. Let me find my dwelling place in the altar, Lord. Nothing else will suffice. Nothing else will satisfy. Nothing else will do what your altar will do. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.